we are happy to host this morning Gabriela Harris. Uh, I'm sure all of you know her. Uh, she's doing a great job with her brand. She's focused on sustainability and doing very high quality product, which is something that I really enjoy and appreciate. And on top of that, she's a passionate woman that is going to share with us what she's doing with her brands. And we are going to have the opportunity to ask her question. I'm going to interview her after the presentation she's going to give. And obviously, we are open to have questions as usual when we have a key industry leader. So thank you so much for being here this morning. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for having me. And um, it's an honor to be here and, and able to share what we're doing and our, our thoughts and our, our values in the company. So... We think first it's good to start with a, a little video about my upbringing in, in Uruguay. In, and this video is important just because it shows you the values that when you grew up in a place where you are really remote, two hours and a half from the closest city, you grew up with sustainability, but as a point of utilitarian, because things are very well made, but because you are so exposed to the elements, they need to be well made and they need to be passed from generations. So the principle that I was brought up, brought up by was good quality and few. I was never an excess. And so, um, and I also, my passion for people also comes from growing up in a ranch where you're like outnumbered by, by animals, um, by thousands and thousands. I think the population in Uruguay is 3.5 million people and there's like 12 million heads of cattle. So that just gives you a... <laughs> A, um, an idea of where that, that is. But uh, we can start with the video and then we'll continue. Santa Isabel is my father's ranch in Paysandú, Uruguay. But my family has been here for six generations. I like wearing my father's boots. It is a certified cattle and merino sheep farm. It's also a place where I bring my family to center and so they can understand, as I did growing up, where things come from and how we belong to nature. And nature does not belong to us. I had this dream or an urge that is actually building in me to really do in high-end fashion the principles that I've learned in ranching and um, the type of product that we do here which is high-end quality product and that same principles um, to be transferred to making clothes for other people. I decided to launch Gabriela Hurst which is a family business Que es eso que me contabas ayer de, del frigorífico, le dijeron, a pap que, le dijeron que papá era uno de los primeros en... Cuando empezaron a certificar para carne orgánica... Papá fue uno de los primeros. Seguro, fue de los primeros que se, que se auditaron. En el tema de, de lo ecológico, Lalo fue un innovador, como quien dice, porque este, desde aquel momento ya decía, no, este, van no vamos a este estar fresco porque este, se le cambia la, la alimentación a los bichos y le, sí. se le altera el producto de la carne creo que bueno nos marcó a los dos pero conmigo fue bastante clara en que todo se tenía que mantener eh, igual como lo estaba haciendo él porque había encontrado su fórmula que, que desde un punto de vista de Ecológico servía, productivo servía y económico servía. Entonces, ¿por qué cambiar algo que le funciona? Entonces, sí, desde que falleció él, creo que fue mantener la, la visión y la visión que él tenía de cómo, de cómo manejar. Creo que vos también estás implementando muy bien los, los sí. cambios donde se puede mejorar sí, aún más, sí, pero continúa así. Sí, todo tal cual le estuviera, ¿sí? No cambiamos nada. Sí, yo a veces sueño que él viene y chequea todo. La lana es buena y fina. Sí, es la, 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 en realidad a mí lo que me, me... Yo no estaba pensando, porque es como lidiaba con al final, el principio que no lo ponía juntos al, al concepto. Seguro. Era algo tan obvio, hasta que Austin sí, me no. empezó a decir, pero tenés que sacar lana del campo. De la misma producción. Sí. 
y, y nada. Y no, no, le agrega mayor valor al producto. La idea, el concepto es saber de dónde viene el producto y la lana, que sabes que desde un lugar así. Y la trazabilidad que se uh -huh. le dice. La misma. De sus inicios hasta el producto final. A friend of mine always calls it a honest luxury because it's luxurious, it's um, made with the best materials and the best way we can possibly can, but it has a conscious. My father had a dream and this was his dream and we're in his dream. Making clothes is my dream, so it's, it's a mixing both of these dreams together. The tweed is made in Manos del Uruguay. I met with Gabriel at our beach house to discuss Manos del Uruguay, which is a 48-year-old co-op and it's a major supplier of quality product to the fashion industry. El objetivo de Manos del Uruguay es crear una fuente de trabajo para la mujer en el interior del país sin desarraigarla desde su, de su lugar de donde vive y que continúe en su entorno familiar y además eh, prepararla y capacitarla en distintos aspectos agregando así un valor importante al, a lo que es el crecimiento personal de cada una de nosotras. Al final del día queremos usar el mejor tweet posible. Mandamos los diseños de nuestros tweets a Escocia y a manos del Uruguay. Y vamos a elegir cuál los iba a quedar mejor. Y el de manos fue superior y, y fue una decisión totalmente subjetiva. Cuando uno compra un producto de manos del Uruguay, tiene la etiqueta, dice quién lo elaboró, el nombre de la persona que lo elaboró y la localidad. Estas lanas que trajiste son las, las, las lanas clásicas, ¿no? Sí, la más clásica es esta, uh -huh. es este hilado que realizan de, de este top. Sí. Las cooperativas eh, lo procesan, lo hilan manualmente, ¿sí? obteniendo esta fibra por me, medio de un retorcido sí. manual y después es teñido también por las artesanas en las cooperativas. Lo que refleja una prenda de manos desde el inicio hasta el día de hoy es primero que es creada con una fibra natural, por lo tanto es una fibra duradera. En el caso de manos es una organización que se autosustenta sola. Sí, sí. Entonces este, de, de su artesanía, de su manualidad y, y de su eficiencia que tiene que lograr por medio de la calidad y, y, y de, de cumplir a, a tiempo con los clientes, es que este, después tenemos que vivir todo el año. For each collection, the team must produce a lookbook. For this fall, we found a cement factory and used the concrete blocks as the set on this cold February morning. I want our customers to buy one only. I don't want them to buy like 10 sweaters a season. I want them to buy one or two really good sweaters. I think that we'll, we'll try to do it um, in a way that it's sustainable for everyone. It's, it's the only way possibly to think any business today. We choose and we're engaged with what we're making. So it is well thought out in every aspect so that we make sure that this product that was done with utmost quality with a very low impact in the environment and usually when you are doing things that are well done um, they, they end up being that way. This collection is not, nothing different from, from the past in the sense that women were my main focus but I also noticed that I was 
um, attracted to certain lines that I always do in clothing and stripes and then I was doing dots and then I, pu I put it together and I realized it's, it's Morse code. So I called a, this is a gown, I called a mentor of mine and I said to her what word should we write in the Morse code? This is completely embroidered and that one's beaded. And she said, Gabby, there's only one word that you can write and that's love. And this is the Nina bag or as I like to call it, the Powerball. To be here in this in the ranch with my family, and uh, you know, we I'm always imagining how my dad would be so delighted that everybody's here. And uh, we put Jack in a little Shetland pony yesterday, and I can just imagine, or maybe he was seeing it from somewhere, how happy he would be. My life in New York and my life in in uh, Uruguay, so they're, they're coming together, and it's really interesting to see and um, and what we're trying to create. There's a really a respect to nature and to do the things the right way. And the beauty in, in simple but good, you know, that when something is really good, well made, you just need that. Well, I think these are just a slide that we prepared from, yeah. that we can just fast forward while we do the questions. This is an interesting image. This is a, my, my mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is the image where I've been working in clothes for um, 14 years, and, but launched Gabriela Hurst uh, on February of 2015, so just uh, over uh, three years. But it is always this image that, that has inspired me from the start. And um, she actually, my mother, has inspired me too. Even the, the suit I'm wearing is from our first collection. Um, and it's something that she would wear. The, um, the, she was 18 years old. And she was competing in rodeos at this time. And uh, Uruguay, this was 1971. I was born in 1976. It used to be a very, uh, even if it's a country of progressive ideas, in that period of time, it was the um, dictatorial period ship. So it was a very conservative society. So I had my mother, which was a bit of a trailblazer. She, she was doing rodeos. Then in the 30s, she decided to do, be a taekwondo black belt. She became a second dan. And then she uh, became a Buddhist, a Zen Buddhist in Uruguay, which is my majority Catholic country. And then um, she started doing weightlifting in her 40s, 50s. <laughs> and now she does long, uh, long distance races on horses. So she, for me, she broke that mold. I grew up in a, in a mold on a house where women could do things, where they were not, she, the society would dictate something and she would just do what she thought was the right thing to do which obviously growing up I was always embarrassed about it, but um, <laughs> when you grow up and you, you, you understand the courage and bravery of what you have to do to, 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 you know, to break, break the norm, and why are you breaking the norm? And she taught me a lot of those values. So I am very, very close to this image. I actually have it on top of my desk because it, it shows a lot of strength to me. Mm -hmm. Good, so Gabriela, when you decided to are your brand. Mm -hmm. We are going to focus first of all on the branding side and after that we are going to focus on your collection yeah. and uh, a, what you're doing as a value proposition. So I always had a, a question about it. Why did you decide to name it by yourself? Because nowadays, I mean this is a big risk in the future in case you want to actually open your uh, company to new investors, etc. So this is always a, the main risk for investors is having the name of the creator as the name of the, of the brand. So why did you decide to, to do that movement? Well, there's two, there's two parts to that. The, the first, I've, decide, I've designed under other names for, for a long time. And because this project came from a very particular part of myself and it was in the transition where I inherit uh, my dad's ranch in South America and there was a there was a conflict between between what I was doing in the US and what my life had been and I was very keen of working with 
prime materials. So it was important that I put my name out there because when you put your name, you can't hide. You know, it's like your name is there. So you really, really have to, it's, it's very different. I experienced both things to have, and it's, it's a different level of commitment, as you say, because you have so much more risk. But as a, as a long-term view, because that's two of my guidelines for, for the decisions in the companies, long-term view and sustainability, as a long-term view, the, the job as a founder and creative director, and at this point I'm, I'm running the company, um, is to give as much of, DNA, of your DNA to the company and develop it to the level that at one point the brand will not need the person, let's say in the next generation. Because there's so much work that it's, it takes more than one lifetime to develop, and I am interested in, in that, in making sure that we bring, some, we bring something to the table that is long-lasting. You're speaking about DNA. So what are the key points of your DNA? And after seeing the video, I'm sure they are very clear for everybody. And how do you manage to transmit it? Because at the end, one of the biggest uh, challenge of uh, the marketing team is to educate consumers. So how do you transmit that to consumer and what are they, the key point of your DNA and the way you express it? Well, it's, it's a continuing, uh, uh, I would say, it's a continuing thing that you have to really guard the values and of your company and, and, and of your vision. And the, the main thing is that you have to be true to it and you have to not be persuaded by, by other voices. You have to... Um, be open to hear another point of view and you have to, but you have to basically explain your vision and what you're seeing because that's our job, right? And, and to really make sure that everybody understands it and then collaboratively everybody's involved in developing this further in the team. But it's a constant uh, re-education, especially when we are so young because any new team member, we have to re-educate our values and our values is we do not compromise on quality. I don't care, like it has to be the best fabric and the best craftsmanship that we can achieve because that's what I want to give to our customers. I, I think that this, I, I don't think you can fool the luxury customer anymore. I don't think that they are truly educating themselves and we were just having the conversation about your pants, you know, like you know your pants. Nobody's gonna fool you with the wrong pants. So that's what I'm trying to, to, to do with, with what we do. It's like be honest luxury. This is the materials we're using. This is the people who is, who is making us. And this, the design for that reason and purpose has to be timeless, timeless. And when people think of timeless, sometimes they're like, you know, associated with the word boring. But timeless design is, is something very difficult to achieve. It means that that piece is contemporary 10 years from now or 10 years ago. So all that encompasses the materials, the craftsmanship, and the design. Those are like the main, main focus. And obviously, it has to be the North Star has to be this desirable, because what we make is not something that people need. So it has to be desirable. And, and then the other part is I don't want to be doing this if I am adding to the major problem, which is we are the second biggest polluters, is the second biggest polluting industry in the world. And it, this is like my, my personal battle of like, um, personally, I am very, very um, concerned about uh, the environment. And so those values are also transparent, also transferred to my professional life about quality, you're speaking about having a timeless um, clothing line. And actually, when thinking about the industry, being timeless is uh, actually one of the worst fears for companies. I, I'm, I'm thinking about, for example, Domenico de Sole and Tom Ford when they arrived uh, to Gucci, and they had, well, a very destroyed brand, but they had a timeless line of product. So how do you manage quality, sustainability with grow and scalability. Because at the end, you have created a brand and I'm sure you expect it to grow, to be scalable. But this is a very complicated equation. 
actually. So I would like to see your, uh, yeah. so <laughs> your vision. I, so actually, for a brand that is starting, it's less uh, challenging. It's more challenging for a brand that's already, a company that's already set up. I'm talking from the sustainability point of view. Because I am so passionate about this subject and so curious about, I, I'm, we're solving problems as, as by sometimes by as simple as just asking a question. Um, we are changing all our packaging. I have this goal that's quite ambitious from ap to April 2019. Um, and you can hold me accountable. Um, that to get be plastic free. I hate plastic. Like I hate the usage of plastic. Plastic was not in our life till you know 60, 70 years or, or years ago. We have 6,000 years of civilization where we didn't need plastic and we did just fine. And now it's actually, you know, I'm not going to be dramatic, but it's killing us. It's going through the the, the food chain in the oceans. There's um, five trillion pieces of plastics, and it's the microplastics. Nine percent of all plastics get recycled. That's nothing. And the rest of the plastics, actually, they just go to a landfill. And then the earth absorbs it. So that's where we are. They don't disappear. It takes 500 years to disappear. We found a product that has just had six years of R&D, and uh, we are just implementing it. And we haven't been able to implement it through all our, our back of office, meaning when we ship the product which is TIPA packaging, which is this polymid that's injected with this substance, which basically makes the plastic decompose in 24 weeks besides 500 years. So it is, it's created by two Israeli women. You can find out more about it, TIPA, T-I-P-A. And um, it, it is, it is a, it's, a, it's a solution. It's one of the solutions that we are implementing. But it's also the hangers. Everybody has for shipping hanger, plastic hangers. So, TIPA is on flexible packaging, so it's not on hard plastic. So it's really about finding. So if I can find it that I'm a smaller company, big companies can do it too. Like going through, through making using that your, resourceful, your resources are not wasted. For example, making sure that you're using all your fabrics that you have in stock. You're not buying more fabrics that we tend to want to get the new, the, always the new, but new doesn't mean better. In, that's where imagination needs to come, come in. This is like, these are your materials, this is what you have. So every time that you can try to stop yourself from not using your available resources and being less wasteful, because that's in all over. You know, it's not just in the fashion industry, that's also in the food industry, um, where you have that discrepancy of, of over a billion people uh, are overweight and then you have 850 million people that um, don't have food or are or limits of famine. So, and then we have all this wastage of food. So it's about being less wasteful. Do I really need this? Like really be conscious about what you consume in every level. So that's from, and from, the, from my side, from, and I am actually making and selling products, how can I do this with the less impact possible? And for me, I, going back to your point, I believe that it's easier for me, as a, it's easier for us as a smaller company to, de, to implement these policies. But bigger companies have also the technology. It's all our tip of our hands. Everybody can change that right now. It's just a matter of like willing to do it. And from my personal experience in my business, every time that we put sustainability as a main guidance, even like the back strategy for example, it's always a successful choice. The reason why our bags have a waiting list or have this um, way of being sold is because somebody showed me a wholesale plan, my head of sales, and it meant I had to sell double the amount of bags to make the same amount of money. I was like, no more natural resources, more, no, let's just keep it how we are. We, you know, then we'll open our stores and we'll keep the distribution like this. But it was really a sustainable thought that was the one that brought me to to a successful um, business choice. I was preparing some part of my final lecture for Saturday this morning, and now I was going to speak about framing and reframing, the importance of framing in fashion and uh, in luxury. So do you think that we need to reframe the concept of traditional luxury and fashion nowadays? Yes. Because I it's all about consuming. So brands are focused, obviously, to, to get more consumer and have them consuming the most they can. 
and it's all about trend, and it's all about having them purchasing more and more. So that's the opposite. So do you think we should rethink the way fashion and luxury companies are organizing their strategies? I think that, I mean, for me, the, the answer is obviously yes, because when we launch, I want it to be free of trends, right? I want it to create beautiful product that was desirable. I don't want to be a slave to trends. I, it's kind of walking that thin line. But we're, we're a luxury product. We're not, per se, a fashion product. We fall in that category. I consider myself we're in the fashion industry, but it's, we're not slave to trends. I believe that living in New York City and like, you know, with your team and researching your own subconscious and whatever you've been inputted, you can create product that has that design. I do think that there has to be a shift. And, um, and I, I don't know the, which, you know, it's for each brand, each <coughs> policy, but if you're going to be a massive brand, again, going to the same point, if you're gonna be a massive brand and you wanna, be creating newness and newness and newness, that doesn't mean that the newness cannot be done in a more clever way that's less impacting the, in the environment. Great. Just, I want to add one thing. <laughs> I think that there is this concept that we need to really reframe to that, that there can be hedonistic sustainability. There is a place for beauty and pleasure in sustainable practices because we've lived like this, we've developed like this. It's just a matter of remembering. Great. So let's move now uh, to uh, the entrepreneurial side because at the end creating a brand, I mean, it's very risky. Yeah. Everybody who start a new project need to live and deal with risk. And this mm -hmm. is hard, especially when you start having more and more employees and getting more international. So it means you have more worries when you go to the bed at night. Oh <laughs> so, what have been the most important step of your entrepreneurial adventure, actually, that you say, well, you know, those were actually the most important step that made it happen and the most important decision that I had to take? There's several, um, but I'm gonna narrow it down to one thing. It took me a long time, and remember, this is like my second time in the rodeo, so I had had some experience before and lessons that I've learned the hard way, but I'm gonna just focus it on Gabriela Hurst. I think that what I am most proud of is team building. Um, you, I have this, I like this quote that says, uh, vision without execution is hallucination because it's really, it's, you need a team. You need your team, you need, you need the belief system, um, for those Latin people in here, we know what it means when you put like with la camiseta puesta, you know, with like, you know, you're part of a team. And I think what I am most proud of is the evolution of my team and also the long-term employees that I've been working with. And um, I also work with my best friend and we've worked together, lived together and, and having those people around that support and believe what you're seeing and help you execute it, that's the, my biggest pride and the, one of the things that I feel that we um, are continuing to, to create, which is very important, a culture and a, and a, and a, and a tight team. Mm -hmm. As a leader, how do you manage to keep the culture of the organization? And especially because- I'm extremely funny. <laughs> <laughs> I am the funniest person ever. <laughs> Because, well, the, the, the contradicting thing is you are in the luxury industry but in the fashion industry at the same time. So you have to go to tell your value proposition to people that are actually in the opposite side. They want to sell more. They, they, they want to expand brands. And what you're doing is, 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 is expandable, obviously, but, mm -hmm. I mean, not as much as a traditional fashion uh, industry. So you, you are changing, actually, uh, the, 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 the framework. So internally, it's very easy to motivate my team in those things that matter because half of them are mothers. So um, we, we really care. So my team really cares about what are they gonna leave their children in what situation. And we come, I come from a culture that you're supposed to leave your children better off. And uh, as, a, as a generation, I don't know how we're doing that to our children. So I, I think that you know, that in that part, it's very, very um, easy. And also those values, right, are the guidelines to know if a person is gonna be a, the right team member or not, 
we all have to believe and they all feel very, very proud. And it's not it's not only this, it's also the, 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 the initiatives that we, we do. Everybody wants to feel that they're doing something and they're giving. And so that is really important. Um, and then we, we've, um, on the business side, we've implemented the ethos of our brand in a wholesale strategy when we started because we're just opening our store in November. So we're like in the very beginnings of our company. And our first store is going to be open in November. So before, our way of um, generating was direct to consumer with the handbags, but we started with, with wholesale for our ready to wear and our shoes. But we implemented our sales strategy in the same way that we think about the brand. We have uh, around 70 uh, doors worldwide, which is, it's, and they're very curated. They're partners that we feel that are the partners that have the right values and that um, we can cater in the best of our abilities. And so our growth, it's, our sales are tripling, but it's within our same partners. So we haven't spread ourselves to sing. We just go deep, which mm -hmm. is like my philosophy in, in general. Have few, but just go deep. Mm -hmm. You have mentioned quality, and I love speaking, especially with entrepreneurs and CEOs, about quality. Because, well, as you mentioned, you're not a huge company, mm -hmm. so the quality department, I assume, is not huge. So how do you make sure you meet the standard? And I, I mentioned that mm -hmm. for what you were telling me at the very beginning, the way you test product uh, yourself, actually, and make sure they are durable. But how do you do that with the whole line? Well, it, it is, first of all, I have people as the head of, everybody has that um, mentality. It's not only me. So my, my head of production, um, she, she has a passion. You can, you can tell when people have a passion for quality. And if we're talking quality, it's like you, you get excited for a great piece of bread and, and butter, you know, like the best bread and the best butter. It's like you, you get, you feel the passion. So we're talking about passion. So these people that I work with and I myself, we share this. And so it, it is, it is, uh, it is e it's not easy because you're, you know, you, the relationship with our meals and everything. But by now, people know what we, they expe we expect. So the meals, they know that they are not showing me any polyester. They are not showing me any viscose that's not certified. You know, they just, they just know because you, keep, you can demand. But that's the part that I'm so surprised, that if we, that we're not that large, can demand this, can you imagine what a big company can change? And so um, it's about, and no fabric gets changed or anything uh, without me approving. So basically, it comes from the top and it spreads. But yeah, tough on it. <laughs> Perfect. So I would love to open uh, questions for our participant. Um, Yes, Aaron. Uh, just wait for the microphone. Yes. Do you want to take the slides and go by? Oh. Yes. You go first. Hi, my name is Pirinia. I'm from Iceland. I lived in Spain for many years where I ran a fashion retail company. And this has been so inspiring. Um, I share your passion for sustainability and luxury. That's where we were just discussing Moonshot um, with our leadership teacher this morning. And we were, I was, um, telling her about my moonshot, which is um, hopeful in the future, to be able to work in the intersection of sustainability and luxury. So um, I was reminded of um, something called, in Spanish, objeto compañero. I don't know if you can help me translate that, which is um, Enrique Lueve, who is of the Lueve family, um, um, was explaining the, um, you know, about luxury products, that, you know, the value of them is also they, they travel with you through life. So um, they're meant to last. So that's really um, the reason why I'm interested in luxury is because these are products which have a meaning and they travel through life with you. So um, I'm so inspired that you're actually doing this from that standpoint of, sus of sustainability because even though luxury is doing everything from quality and everything is done so well, but they have really lagged behind in, in applying sustainable methods. And um, so I'm just wondering, do you think that what you are doing with your brand could influence um, both the luxury brands or the fashion labels to start doing what you are doing? Well, I, I definitely, I am so willing to share everything that I, um, first of all, I love Iceland. <laughs> I love Iceland. 
I always, it's like my country is 3.5 million people. Iceland is 350,000. So it's like, always like, oh my God. But I love, I love your country. I've been there um, and it's, it's, it's a great, talk about great bread and butter and great coffee. <laughs> You want a good coffee? Go to Iceland. It's amazing. And, and you're exposed to the elements. Too. And you're exposed to the elements. So, so you understand where I'm coming yeah. from, and and where nature. You're, you're. That is very key to 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 your point because we live in in these cities, right? That we feel like we're separated from nature. Like we're that. And in ice, in a place like Iceland, you understand the impact of nature and how minuscule we are and like you know most people go through that subject of um, let's save the planet it's like you are delusional like you, the planet will get rid of us it's like you save humanity if you want to and so I so I'm willing to share everything we discover I try to be as vocal as I can with it um, but going back to the beautiful concept of, of um, <coughs> a companionship of an object of where you of you, that object that goes with you and lasts through your period. Like I'm the, when you were talking about that, I was thinking of my dad's briefcase, that he had one briefcase and the older he got, the more you know, damage and the leather and the, the, you could see the life of it. And so be surrounded by objects, be your furniture or anything that will show you life. I think that that is very, very beautiful. And, um, and that's a concept that we, we uh, have very close to our heart, and I and I think people that will desire that will have it. That's my dad. Radical. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Aram. I'm from Toronto, Canada. Um, so my question for you is: You mentioned the impact of the fashion industry and the importance of sustainability in the environment and the repercussions that we face by being such a wasteful industry. Um, speaking to a room of consumers and lovers of fashion, what are some ways that we can be more sustainable as consumers? Um, know about the brand, you know, and how they're doing things. I think that's the number one thing. And then, um, I know it's a very anti-commercial idea, but just question yourself. Do I really, really love it, you know? And like, give yourself that time. Because sometimes you, you will fall into this place where you're buying things and we all done it to make us feel better. And then, but that moment of happiness doesn't last that long and then the emptiness come again. So just be mindful that you're getting it because it's gonna give you so much pleasure to have it for a long time. And just, you're gonna see it and it's gonna make you happy. So I would just be conscious about that. Any more questions? Hi, I'm Victoria. I'm from Uruguay. Come on, mate. And uh, well, of course, I know your brand, and I would like to know how it would change from the previous one, Candela, mm -hmm. right, to this point of uh, your, yours now nowadays. So the, the change the change was based on on Candela was uh, we started with nothing with seven hundred dollars seal screening in Brooklyn, um, and it, because of the of the investment on how we developed. We, we were more of a contemporary price point. So I wasn't being able to work with the materials I wanted to work with. And I wasn't able to, I was selling to department stores that they were asking me for lower, um, for lower quality, lower price point. And there's a point that it's like, there's a contradiction between what you're doing and, and, and what your beliefs. And it, it was just not gonna work. And, um, so I, while I was doing Candela, I was dreaming about, it was gonna start only with shoes at the beginning. So for two years I dreamt about, I wanted to work, I was desperate to work with the best materials I could put my hands on and really have this visual aesthetic. So it, it took me a while to do the jump and I'm very grateful for my Candela period because I did a lot of the learning experience in it. Um, and I knew that I needed to restrict my distribution before I was younger, like there would be a big department store come and buy the product and they will buy like, I want all of this. But that was not a good business decision. It's a, sometimes you have to like curate and edit and like really put your point of view to it. So, um, so it was, yeah, it was the same driver of, of, of creating Gabriela Hearst that, that um, made me do that transition. Are you still inspired by Uruguay, even of though course. you live here? 
I, I, I know you do, but I just wanted to hear from you. <laughs> you know, we have a saying, you can take the girl out of the country, but not the country out of the girl. So that is really, yeah, in everything I do. Perfect. So, <laughs> um, going back to the entrepreneurial side, uh, what are the biggest challenges you have experienced as an entrepreneur? And especially, I would like to to speak about financing because this is actually one of the biggest challenges for an entrepreneur. I know we have some entrepreneur here, so I'm sure they they are experiencing the same issues, and uh, that's very valuable if you share with us your experience. Well. Um, I had the opportunity to create two projects, right? One with from scratch, really organic, and then the Gavila Hearst was we had a budget, so we had were able to really choose who we were going to work with, right? Um, the pressures of each of these are different. The efficiencies are different. Obviously, being well funded is important, but it's it's not the only thing. You have to be. Um, uh, mindful of how you're going to 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 develop this, and also not being uh, wasteful, to making sure that you know you start slow. You don't. You can't just develop a brand. Even if you put, if it was a matter of money and marketing, everybody would have a successful brand, right? Like we get people. A lot of people would have, but it's not. You, you, things have to grow organically. You have to like develop your vision. And, um, and uh, last year was a, a very successful year for us. We were cash positive by the end of the year. So it, it was a, a matter of understanding we don't have a huge team. We work really hard. It's like understanding, like, do we need this now? Do we not need now? There's obviously moments of growth that you have to push a, a cash injection, and you have to be ready to, to, to do that. Um, uh, Maybe some, you know, it's like some companies you're gonna have to find. But if the business is doing good, if the product is selling well, you know, that's a is a good route to 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 find. But I try to not, you know, and sometimes it, I would be, maybe I'm too conservative on these things where I we really, you know, think in a certain way um, to be efficient to not really have the team having too many people, that's the biggest component in New York. I think it's, you know, the salaries and it's an expensive city, so that takes a lot of our resources. So I think that that's really an understanding, you know, the commitment of the people and when we need to add someone and, and, and work. It's very challenging, I have to say, to really um, work within knowing when is the next injection of growth that you need. For example, for us, it's the store, so we have a very clear vision. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so a brand is all about consumer. Obviously, if you don't have consumer, you don't have a brand. Yeah. That's that's clear. So let us speak about consumer. I always uh, like to speak about that with uh, big companies, especially because there's some moment where big companies don't really understand their, their their consumer because it's very very easy to have this, you know imaginary and virtual consumer that doesn't exist. You say, well, my consumer is like that, like that. They're looking for that. And after that, you start making surveys and you say, well, what's going on? Why are not we selling? Well, because you do the value over the time with your value proposition, so you are inconsistent. So all of the brands are at some point face that problem. Well, Armani is changing it, it's facing it right now. I mean, they, they diluted the brand. They, 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 they literally have a misconception about what the consumer wanted. So, well, who is your client? What do they want, actually? And what's your value proposition and how that value proposition fit them? And how you make sure you keep having a clear vision, especially not having a large team. And when you don't have a large team, you, you don't have a lot of resources to make continuous surveys. So. Yeah, I, have a, I don't have a large team, but they're very smart, so I'm very lucky. <laughs> so, um, the, the, um, so we had an, uh, a vision of who we so had a suspicion of who the customer was. And um, we actually did research, and we found out that we were actually quite accurate on who, who, who our customer was, and is a woman. She's dynamic, she's of action, she's in the world. Some of them are lawyers, they, they all work. So I've designed in my head, when I think of them, I think of their lifestyle, 
They need their workwear, they need their weekend wear. Suiting is a really strong category for us. It's over 25% of our um, ready-to-wear sales. Um, they, but they need also their weekend, so our knitwear, the, the cashmeres, the, those, those elements. Um, they do have some uh, um, events, so cocktail parties, and eventually like there is one big event, which is like you need the gown, um, also outerwear. But, so I really built the collections in like, are we thinking of her? And, and then my, our value proposition is that we look further in the product. And this is something that maybe we haven't even vocalized so much, but all our jackets, all our blazers are lined with silver lining. This is just an example. And this silver lining, it protects you from uh, radio frequency of your cell phones and uh, anti-cellular radiation. So it's kind of a controversial topic. So I was thinking the worst case scenario, just have a silver lining that you don't see in your pockets of your jackets. And the best case scenario, we, we protect you from your cell phone. So it's always thinking of like, what's further from the product? Like what else can we give to our, our, our woman um, and our client? And so it's always thinking of that extra thing of the utilitarian aspect of it, of, of their lives. So I, I actually think of, of the life, I think of women all the time and I think of the life of our customer. Just two last questions from my side. Key success of your brand. Why? you think you're growing your product and being so well accepted? I think it's authentic. I always say that to the team. We have the luxury. We don't have to BS. We don't have to sell you a marketing story. We don't have to, we just have to transmit the passion that we're doing. <laughs> and, um, and actually our biggest challenge is that we're so focus on the product and every time that I feel like I'm being arrayed too much out of the product, I push myself back to the product and that sometimes we're not even saying everything. We're not being able to vocalize all, all the things that go into the, the process. Um, and so I, I think that's the, the biggest thing that it's there's, I want to bring a certain level of, of uh, transparency and you know, this is what we do. Question, when are you going to start a main line? <laughs> Very soon. I actually have a date for that. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So I don't know if you have any more questions for her. Uh, perfect. So it's Thank a you so much. A pleasure to have you. Thank you.